So who are the toads? Um, the Kahanzi spray toads are true toads in the family Bufanidae. Um, they have a warty appearance, although they are quite small that it is hard to see um, the, the appearance very clearly sometimes. They do have parotid glands, partially webbed hind toes, and they lack external tympana. Um, can you, are you able to see the cursor on the screen? Okay, I'm going to assume yes. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to point out this is a male. Um, there is sexual dimorphism. This um, dark lateral line is um, very clear in the males, and then they also have these inguinal patches um, in between their hind legs um, that get darker as they age. This photo here is of a female, um, and it is um, very light, but they still have a little bit of a lateral line, um, and they don't have those darker inguinal patches there. Um, that is a juvenile that is sitting on top of the female, and that was a staged photo. Um, they are true, um, in true anurin fashion, they eat insects and anything else that will fit in their mouth, so they would also eat the juvenile toadlets. Uh, that baby is probably about a week old. It's starting to develop some of the coloration on its side. Um, you can see that uh, faint white line that's right there. When they're first born, they um, are a purpley, blackish color, um, and they are born. They're ovoviviparous, meaning that they're, the eggs are fertilized internally and develop the egg and tadpole stage develops internally in the oviduct of the female. Um, so this does occur in a few species of frogs and toads, um, but it is um, pretty uncommon from the normal tadpole uh, cycle that we're all familiar with. Um, the gestation is about 30 days and those eggs and tadpoles are able to be seen through the skin on the female's uh, ventral side on her belly. Um, the skin is a little bit translucent, um, so it's, it's pretty neat to see when they're pushed up against the glass. Unfortunately, I don't have any good pictures of that. Um, they have this melodic chirping call that the males do, um, and they uh, also the males also do this really um, interesting push-up behavior. Um, I call it a superman pose, um, and they do that uh, mostly in proximity to other males. These toads are from Kahanzi uh, Gorge in Tanzania, East Africa. Um, and this is the Eastern Arc mountain range. The specific location um, here is here in blue that one of the project, um, one of the gentlemen that worked on the project with us, um, Andy Odom, took a GPS on one of the hikes up into the gorge um, and got some GPS tracks for that. Um, so because the toad is endemic to this area, um, and I know um, that there's a lot of other endemic species there, um, there's a species of coffee and a species of butterfly um, that are right in the area where the toad is, um, but I was curious about in the general vicinity, so I just looked at Wikipedia, and in the Eastern Arc Mountain Range, there are 75 species of vertebrates that are endemic, thousands of species of invertebrates, and 16 plants that are endemic to this mountain range, which is pretty amazing. So the original habitat that these toads came from um, was this amazing waterfall. Um, it was over 800 meters high, and the water would fall over the waterfall, crash down, and splash up to the sides of the uh, rock faces, creating these misty meadows. Um, unfortunately, I could not find any photos of the original habitat, um, so I have to, you have to make do with a clip art photo of a waterfall right there. Um, this area is um, shaded um, and the meadows are quite cool, uh, 16 to 26 degrees Celsius or 61 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit and um, pretty close to 100% humidity. All of the plants that grow in the area are low growing, um, approximately 30 centimeters or lower. Club mosses such as Selaginella, ferns, grasses, and some flowering plants such as begonia and impatiens.
So the original habitat was unfortunately altered um, to make way for the Kahanzi Dam um, and the need for the dam was for a hydro power plant um, to supply electricity for the country. Um, this, this, power, this hydroelectric power plant currently supplies about 13% of the power for the entire country um, and I believe it runs at about 80% of capacity. Um, this, the hydroelectric power plant is run by Tenesco and it's called the Lower Kahanzi Hydropower Plant. And um, when, when they were deciding to, or when they decided the need for the hydroelectric power plant, they did pre-construction biosurveys. Um, and that was in about 1994. Um, and the toad was discovered as part of this process in 1996. Um, and this project was, um, the, the hydroelectric power plant was financed by the World Bank. So the toad recovery was also partially financed by the World Bank. So the dam diverted the um, water from the waterfalls um, and instead of crashing over the rocks and creating these amazing misty spray meadows, the water now goes through a series of tunnels and turbines under the mountain and is returned further downstream. The, um, they are able to bypass the, um, the dam and there's only a fraction of the original water that now goes over the waterfall. Um, and this has been fully operational since May of 2000. Um, so because such a low amount of water is going through, this has created drastic changes to the environment. Uh, so the um, diversion of the water caused lots of problems. <laughs> Um, it allowed the out, outer forest area um, to start encroaching into the wetland habitat. So there was um, a lot of woody plants started to grow in the area. A lot of invasive um, animals started to move in. There were um, lowland frogs that started to come in, chameleons, safari ants. Um, and in addition to all of the invasive species coming in, the ecology of the ecosystem has not been sufficiently understood. Um, because it has been essentially discovered so recently. Um, and there's also a large decrease in the diversity of bug, which is important um, because that's what the toads are feeding on. So not only has the habitat changed, but so has their food source. So the toad is officially listed as extinct in the wild, um, and I think that listing was passed officially in 2009. Um, the, they were last assessed in 2014, um, although researchers have reported to me that uh, they are still finding some toads um, in the wild post some of the hard releases. Um, the original population size was about 17,000 animals in 1999 when those initial biosurveys were done. Um, and again, the biggest threats that these toads are facing are the small range. Um, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, it's a small, uh, it's about five hectare range um, that they come from. So it's very, very small. Um, so the small range habitat destruction due to the dam construction and um, disease risks as well. Um, amphibian chytrid fungus has been found in toads and substrate in the gorge since 2003. Prior to 2003, it was not found there. Um, so that is um, speculated to be one of the causes of decline. Um, when I was at the Bronx Zoo, we did have an outbreak of fungus, chytrid fungus in fortunately restricted to one tank. And it did prove to be 100% fatal to that group of animals. Um, and I believe it was brought in with um, some substrate. And I will get into a little bit more of the um, captive biosecurity measures that we have taken. So um, with the imminent risk that these toads were facing, um, it was decided to collect some of these toads and bring them um, into managed care for um, an assurance colony in 2000. 
Um, they were initially distributed to six zoological institutions within the United States, um, but these populations did so poorly that they were recalled um, to the Bronx and Toledo zoos that were most successful with their populations. Um, the husbandry and the natural history and the biology for these animals was initially unknown, um, and that's probably one of the reasons for um, the initial um, decline in managed care. Um, so some of the things that um, we did, we tri-stormed a lot of different things, and some of the things that worked for husbandry for these animals was having long mist cycles instead of hand misting animals, we um, automated everything. Um, at the Bronx, we needed to use um, reverse osmosis water um, because our water quality was not that good. In um, Toledo, they were able to just use carbon filtered water. Um, eventually, we were able to build an amazing filtration system that took a lot of the uh, sediment out of the water in the Bronx and we were able to essentially pre-filter all of the water and then uh, just have the carbon filter as well. Um, and this uh, allowed us to have all the natural minerals in the water and not have to reconstitute the water with uh, room for error if we miscalculate the salt concentrations um, for that. Um, so we increased the mist cycles. Um, we I had flow through enclosures. Initially, I think we just had them in essentially fish tanks. Um, and we ended up plumbing all of the aquarium. Um, at first we had just a big uh, gravel layer at the bottom and the water would flow through the gravel and then out the drain at the bottom. And eventually we um, created false bottoms in the tanks um, with a very thin layer of gravel. Um, so then there was no standing water in the tanks. It allowed um, any parasites or bacteria um, to flow through and it allowed for a much cleaner environment for the toads. Um, we ended up utilizing all natural materials. Um, at one point it was tried, it was thought that, okay, we want, we, you know, we're having problems with these toads. We don't know what's going on with them. Um, so we had a lot of um, plastic material, the PVC pipes for perching, um, artificial foliage, things like that, that could easily be taken out and disinfected. And we found that using natural materials and, uh, such as live plants was much better for the toads and the toads in these tanks did a lot better. So we ended up switching to all natural materials for all of the toads. Um, anytime we brought new plants in, we would remove all of the dirt from the root balls um, so that there was no chance of um, harboring any, um, any undesirable bacteria or disease in the soil. Um, and then we would soak um, everything in a dilute solution of um, either Novasan or um, Vircon or some other similar disinfectant. Um, so as to not kill the plants, that was only done for a brief amount of time. And then the plants were transferred to a essentially a quarantine tank and they were maintained for a minimum of two weeks before they were introduced into any um, tanks with any amphibians. One of the big challenges that we had was um, breeding insects um, for the initial part. Um, once we figured out, or once the first group of keepers working with them saw how small those little babies are, they realized that they were going to need a steady supply of food to feed those little baby toads. Um, so that was one of the big initial challenges. And that's another benefit to having the naturally planted terrariums that um, it's an, it sustains a lot of springtails um, and small flies in there, um, in addition to what we breed and add in to feed to them. Um, so we also were very careful about biosecurity since this is a population that is managed outside of their home country. Um, if we wanted to eventually release them at the point that we started taking care of them, um, you know, it was just an assurance colony, but we still maintained biosecurity, so they were maintained um, in a single species room, although inside of a building of a cosmopolitan collection. Um, there were biosecurity measures to enter the room. We had to change footwear. Um, we had lab coats that we wore when we were working in the room. Gloves were worn anytime the frogs or any of the substrate material was handled. 
and eventually at the Bronx an amphibian uh, conservation area was developed um, so they were moved out of the cosmopolitan building to a separate building. Uh, in 2007, a population habitat viability assessment was held for the Kehansi spray toads. And um, this was an amazing meeting. Um, this was the first population habitat viability assessment that I participated in. Um, and there were stakeholders present from um, every um, organization that I could think of, um, from academia, government, non-government organizations, private sector, um, from five different countries were able to attend um, this meeting. Um, some of the things that were looked at, um, I have listed here to determine the cause of decline. As I said, um, it's the potential for disease, the potential for habitat destruction. Um, there's potential for pesticides upriver that um, came through the dam. Um, at one point, the dam was flushed um, and a lot of sediment was released. So it's speculated that that potentially could have had a uh, play in the decline, um, habitat issues, project management, um, captivity, the disease, um, diseases that we were seeing in captivity, reintroduction, and population modeling. Um, and so the key um, outputs that this, um, this workshop gave was the extinction risk assessment, management and research recommendations, and inputs to the preparation of a recovery plan for the Kahanzi spray toads. Um, and a side note, the population modeling showed that the best case scenario overall was for captive populations to be maintained in the U.S. and excess toads relocated to Kahanzi Research Center and the excess there then reintroduced into the gorge. Um, so because this is uh, the habitat restoration tract, I'm going to talk a little bit about the habitat restoration. Oh, um, and also as part of the PHVA, one of the things that was talked about was translocating these animals um, to another area. Um, and there is no other area um, on earth that was found that would be a suitable habitat for these toads. Um, so that's why um, everybody went ahead with the habitat restoration. Um, even though the International Union for Con IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature guidelines for reintroduction state that the habitat must be restored and self-sustaining, um, and this habitat will um, is restored at this point, but it is not self-sustaining. Um, so artificial mist lines were installed, and that is the part that's not self-sustaining. They do require maintenance. Um, and they do require um, people to be in the wetlands to check them and maintain them and make sure everything is functioning properly on a regular basis. Um, so these mist lines are able to provide um, approximately 70 millimeters of water um, compared to between 75 to over a thousand um, from the natural spray. Um, so it's not as much as the waterfall, but it was enough um, that they were able to recreate what the meadows, the functionality of the meadows. Um, field studies were initiated um, looking at the plants, looking at um, the invasive species, looking at the insect colonies, um, all of that. Um, there was an MOU created um, for all of the institutions that were involved, um, and that was outside of my scope of the project. Um, and as part of the restoration, they also had to um, manually remove a lot of the inv invasive vegetation that grew in. Um, all those woody plants had to be physically removed um, from the wetlands. So in addition to restoring the wetlands, they also instituted uh, protection of the wetlands. So there are foot baths at the entrance to the woodlands. Um, so before you even start the hike up to the gorge, there is a foot bath that's maintained um, that you have to um, sit for 10 minutes with your feet in a bleach solution. And then there's additional foot baths at the entrance to each of the wetlands. And there's three um, wetland areas that have been restored um, in the gorge. 
the access to this area is restricted and there are armed guards that protect the area. Um, also, um, bridges and walkways have been installed um, to prevent the wetlands from getting trampled by researchers or visitors to the area. So once the um, keepers in the United States were able to figure out all of the husbandry um, and figure out all of the um, details and everything of keeping these toads alive in the United States, we were able to transfer our knowledge to the scientists in Tanzania. Um, we assisted them in setting up um, two facilities. Um, the one on the left is at the Kahanzi Gorge and the one on the right is um, at the University of Dar es Salaam. These are also biosecure facilities. Um, at the um, picture on the right, there's a window that looks into the toad room, that big window um, in the middle of the picture, looks into the toad room. So visitors are able to come and see the work that's being done, um, but the toads are still maintained in a biosecure space that does not allow um, visitors in. And both of these facilities maintain the same biosecurity measures that we maintained in the United States. They have lab coats, there are foot baths, there's restricted access to the buildings, um, they wear gloves when they're handling the animals, um, the, that they're bringing in materials from the gorge. Um, there's less of a concern um, with disease than we had um, in the United States because um, they're taking material from the wetland areas and bringing it in with the toads. Um, our concern in the United States was, to, was if we had um, any diseases with our toads that we would be then bringing that back to Tanzania. So that was a little bit different there. So we assisted them in um, outfitting um, both of these facilities. We assisted them with building the tanks um, and all of, um, all of that kind of stuff, um, build, setting up their water filtration system, um, helping them set up insect cultures. Um, we went to Tanzania to um, work with them there. Um, we had some of the scientists come to the United States and attend the um, AZA amphibian, amphibian population biology and management course, um, as well as work at both the Bronx and Toledo zoos to learn um, everything that we had figured out on how to take care of these toads and keep them alive. The current habitat conditions, um, I was very happy to read this quote in one of the articles I went through, um, that the spray zone vegetation is recovering, the wetland flora important to the Kahanzi spray toad is increased, and the ecosystem is stabilized. Um, so the ecosystem is stabilized is really good news. <laughs> so for reintroductions, um, the first batch of toads was brought back to Tanzania in 2010 for captive breeding. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take these toads um, back for their first journey home. Um, there was a lot of fanfare. We flew on KLM and the flight crew um, was alerted ahead of time. We had to get all sorts of um, special approval um, to take these um, toads on the plane in addition to all of the required permits and everything. Um, we were allowed to have them as carry-on, so they flew in the cabin with me. Um, and the flight crew was so excited about having these toads and the story and what these animals meant. Um, that they um, bought gummy um, frog candy that they passed out to all the kids on the plane. Um, they had frog coloring books that they passed out to kids um, and they, they were just so excited. It was, it was just amazing to see, um, to see their reaction to something that they weren't even involved in, but this is just such an amazing story. Um, it was nice to see how infectious it was. Um, so the first, um, so after the toads were brought back, um, they did work with captive breeding in um, both of the um, facilities in Tanzania, both at Dar es Salaam and at the Kahanzi Gorge facility. And um, toads from the Kahanzi facility were um, then used for soft reintroductions to test substrates and plants and everything to see um, if toads housed out there would immediately succumb to 
um, any diseases or how they would do in that area. And all of those um, softer introductions proved fruitful, um, so they were able to move forward um, and do hard reintroductions. So the first herd reintroduction to the gorge was in 2012, um, and I was also able to participate in that. Um, so you can see um, we carried the toads up um, in styrofoam boxes. We had them all packed in um, plastic deli cups, and uh, we released them out into the wetlands. Um, and to date, about 13 batches of the toads have been brought from the United States to Tanzania for a total of 12,800 toads. Um, and there are about 2,500 toads at each of the breeding facilities in Tanzania, um, and probably about the same amount in um, each the um, Bronx and Toledo zoos. Um, so as of now, Bronx and Toledo are still the only U.S. zoos that are participating in the reintroduction program. Um, but they're both at carrying capacity for their captive populations and husbandry is doing so well that a few other institutions, the Detroit and the Chattanooga zoos, are able to house um, educational populations, um, but those animals are not included in the reintroduction program. So the researchers in the field report that the ongoing hard reintroductions um, are successful, um, but they are finding lower survival um, out there than with um, the toads that are in managed care. And I'm realizing I talked a lot faster than I had uh, intended. Um, so that is all I have for now. These are the project partners. Um, and then I do have a list of um, literature if anybody is interested. I did um, cite a few articles um, in the talk. Um, and then there's also some really interesting reading in here.